Hello, and welcome to 221B Baker Street. Come in, pull up a chair, tell me what is going on. This is my friend and colleague, the doctor. You may speak freely in front of him as you would to me. Hi, welcome. Take a seat here, and I hope you don't mind if I take notes for my case files. Ah, and for these case files, we are going to talk about the elementary episode, The 1% Solution. A, a, a sort of weird reference in titles in that choice, wouldn't you agree? I would. Of course, you remember from the books, it's the 10% Solution, which references uh, Holmes' use of a solution of 10% cocaine when he's not occupied he's has something has to have something to stimulate the brain and it could also be a reference to one of the dumbest ideas i've ever heard for a Sherlock Holmes story the 7% solution <laughs> which in that storyline moriarty is a figment of holmes's drug induced state that you know I guess it's one of those things where people want to take credit or kind of want to do the revisionist and kind of writing where, you know, maybe our heroes aren't heroes after all. And it was mildly interesting. But like you say, it's not the intent of the story. And if you're really a, a Sherlock fan, it, um, eh. it was, it was Interesting as a he monograph. Made, he made sure he made Sigmund Freud. <laughs> what the frick is that? Well, I mean, you know, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, there's been a lot of kind of rewrites to where uh, one of them in particular was that the the hero and the actual detective was Watson, and that Sherlock was an actual, you know, more like an actor. Like he took that's, the that's the Ben Kingsley Michael Caine one, right? And, and I, I thought it, I thought when I heard about that movie, I thought it was going to be like it was a figment of his imagination, which I think would be an interesting idea. But it says just a hired actor. Oh, that was the only reason to watch is watch Ben Kingsley with Michael Caine. That's the only reason to watch the movie. Well, maybe that's how they got the idea to have Ben Kingsley be the uh, the fake Mandarin. Oh, because he also played the the um, the role of the Mandarin who wasn't really the Mandarin he was the only the Mandarin in the eyes of the public that was so bad but we're getting off track here oh no but still we want to talk about a really bad adaptation how about the Christopher Plummer Sherlock Holmes oh yeah jeez and to give someone an idea how bad it was it was the exact storyline of the Johnny Depp movie from hell <laughs> the exact which is all based on this really stupid storyline that surmised Jack the Ripper was a psychotic mason. Right. Part of, uh, you know, cause, cause that's what masons do. You know, they just, they're, they're so secretive that, you know, these things pop up. Yeah. It's, you know, whenever they do these rewrites, you just know they're not going to be good, but I guess we digress. Indeed we do, as often we do in a Sherlock Holmes podcast. But let's dive right into this episode. It starts off with a bang. Ha ha ha. Ah. 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 <laughs> and we see that someone's making a comeback in this episode. Lestrade. After his total blowout of the... Uh, I mean, he had a psychotic episode in the, the one prior to this. Yes, well, he was an addict. The the corpse de ballet. Well, he wasn't so much an addict as he. Well, uh, I guess yeah, he was a. Well, he was an alcoholic, basic uh, going on binges and disappearing after, you know, really kind of going insane trying to catch another um, murderer. Well, I don't think he, they ever showed. Well, I mean, he drank, but I don't think he was a real alcoholic per se. No, his addiction was to fame. Right. That that's correct. Now. Yeah. Now, one thing, because we talked about this, and now I, we like, 
the the adaptation of Lestrade. A lot of fans, I think, are unsure what to think of Lestrade, but I like it because it's not a it's not like saying the character of Lestrade is useless. What it's saying is this is Lestrade with Holmes. If Lestrade didn't try to still become a better detective and just rode Sherlock Holmes's coattails. Well, that is correct, and but that's another thing that. Uh... You know, another difference between the TV series and the book is Holmes never really cared. In fact, he almost preferred that Lestrade take the limelight. And I, it made for an interesting story about, okay, what what would that do to a detective to get all that limelight when you know, eventually he start to believe, you know, the hype and, you know, a little more realism but I think the realism really kind of belies whatever happened in the book. Holmes never kind of batted an eye when somebody took credit. In fact, like I said, he always preferred it. Well, that, that's what, see, the only reason he's a little against it here is because it's having a negative impact. And if even in the books, if Holmes believed that it had negative impact on Lestrade, he'd be the same way, I believe. Right. And like I said, I think that was their their little kind of piece of reality. It's like the reality show within yeah, elementary. But it was funny when uh, Lestrade comes in. And I really, in, for most of the show, I was almost physically embarrassed for Lestrade. But when he comes on and says, you know, shall we match wits? Oh, God. No, 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 no. I think the part that really defines it is when he gets his card and it says, when you eliminate the impossible. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I, it, it's a direct quote. I mean, yeah. come on. I, I, no, but I, what I really like, I, I, I mean, I, I want to see it. What does his other business card say? say you know my methods? <laughs> oh, but, oh, and how about his assistant? Oh, yeah. And not only was she like the consummate assistant, and of course, you know, they played that thing a couple times with Watson. At some point, somebody should have put their foot down and, and said, this is not, you know, she is a consulting detective. She is not Holmes's assistant. And nobody really kind of ever picked up on that. Well, and, well, I think it, they kind of did. In fact, because it was really just her making the mistake, only her. But when you think about it, and I just realized this, the assistant was like, not almost not an homage or a pastiche. It was like that's what a what how that assistant was was how a lot of people perceive perceive Watson to be. Right. In general, I mean, in in any Holmes adaptation. Right. You know, kind of anywhere from the you know the the best friend to the bumbling sidekick, but you know all kind of in between. But really, I mean, that's it was more. You know, I think it was more a partnership, but you know, in the end, the story isn't about Watson. The story is about the consulting detective. But the interplay between, uh, like, you know, there was like some territory fights, you know, from the from Lestrade's assistant, and you know, really, it, it, even to the point towards the end of jealousy. But at some point, somebody I. It would have been nice if somebody just kind of ended that. Uh, well, I think they didn't because, as we see, uh, I think Lestrade isn't going anywhere just yet. I, th I think it's a, I think he's in two more episodes if I if I get my information right. So I think maybe they still might have that moment. I do like how she's like, "You'll never get him." It's like where the f and Watson's just I I think was like they did it really good because I wa I love how Watson they didn't have some kind of fight. I I prefer they didn't have a reaction because I love how Watson's just like yeah and goes in. The, it's like this is oh no the be it's just how she delivers it it's like this is for detectives own assistants wait out here and she's like that's right and just walks in right and you know somebody like that girl should have picked up on it eventually but maybe that's why she's an assistant and not a detective yeah you well, know she's, she's a fan girl right yeah i just i don't know that i like to see lestrade kind of i mean really this is a full-blown detective from Scotland Yard. I just can't believe that he would be 
that bumbling on his own. Well, even even with the fame, there there's still an element of of detective like we got with Detective Bell. You know, he's no Sherlock Holmes, yet he is a good detective. Well, it's, they 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 address that in the episode. See, he's only a detective because he wrote Sherlock's coattails. He was a just. I mean, if he had tried, he didn't earn a detective. He just became one. No, I don't know that that's true. Lestrade was already in the department. No, he not that he got his being a detective from Sherlock, but the fact that he got the notoriety and and you know the the. Uh, the uh, image of success, which was really a mirage, but yet you still, to get into Scotland Yard, you would have to be at least a capable detective. So, you know, and, you know, as you see, he's only been in two episodes. The last one, you know, the whole thing, it kind of blew up with him. So he now is a consulting detective because he can't work for Scotland Yard anymore. And by the end of this episode, they're already having to redeem him. You know, he kind of gets his uh, testicles back and says, you know, hey, I'm not covering up a murder. And so he loses his job and now he's moving in with Sherlock and, and a little more humble. Well, I think that's the point. I think it's like you said, you don't like... Lestrade being all bumbling, but I think that's the point. This was, like, with an addict, they gotta hit rock bottom. I think he saw himself in this, and he wa maybe they're gonna make him improve himself. Maybe, you know, now that I think of it, this show is about all these characters becoming who they are in the books. It's about Sherlock Holmes becoming the gentleman detective. It's about Watson becoming the, the Holmes and Watson. So maybe this is about Lestrade becoming Lestrade. Yeah, that could be. You know, maybe he gets a job on the NYPD and you know things kind of start to roll. But yeah, it. I I do like your theory of it's like the prequel, and we're seeing the development of the characters. Uh, so. Speaking of characters, let's go back to the case. Yes. Okay. So of course they're. I, I just. Oh, but I, I love how they're investigating. Holmes is like, like um, Lestrade's like, oh, that's one. That's one description. Yes, an accurate one. <laughs> well, to you and Watson. <laughs> but yes, they're they're invest apparently there's this big explosion of this like a bunch of government or at least businessman muckety mucks. And, there, and it turns out, they find out one of the waiters, the servers, left barely ten minutes after coming. So that arises some suspicion. But they go to to talk to the people that were hurt, and, and Lestrade is trying to sound like a t detective by going, the mind can play tricks. So let's go back in, in your mind and explore. I love how Holmes is just giving her a car, like, yes, can I get that seating chart when you come out of the depths? <laughs> Yeah, that that was um, like I said. It was just another. I I spent so much of this episode being truly embarrassed for Lestrade, like the dive, really. <laughs> you know, and you know he knows even being on the coattails. I mean, he started even to kind of contradict and try to put uh, Holmes in his place. It's just, just embarrassing. Oh, I oh I know what they should do. They should have the the assistant commit a crime so Lestrade can solve it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I almost really I started to think that Lestrade really was involved to uh, actually solve you know to 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 solve the case. I mean, they almost kind of went that direction with the last episode, didn't they? Somewhat of it. I, I, I'm kind of, now that I think of it, I wonder if we're still going to see the assistant in the coming episodes. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I, you know, it's, I mean, she's she's not bad to look at, and you know, the the whole interplay with between her and 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 uh, Watson was kind of cute, but I think it got it got a little tiresome. I think they handled. They, I think it just came very close to becoming tiresome, but I don't think they went completely. Over. Oh, and how about the Doug chat? Oh, that was instead funny. Instead of instead of TED talks, right? 
I thought I thought somebody was going to get up and do the Dougie, but I guess I was wrong. Oh, jeez, man. Come on, the Dougie, really? <laughs> <laughs> so we see John uh, Bowden and one of the employees, and I really thought, oh, well, there's our red herring. He's uh, completely dis- – the, the day of the – the explosion he disappears like 20 minutes before it happens oh my stomach hurts and you think oh this is you know this is where it's going and of course (laughs) holmes disproves that fairly quickly although it really plays it comes back at the end and you know i gotta give the writers credit i think the writers right now in the battle between elementary and sherlock i think are winning yeah well, as we've discussed in the other episode, it was almost like Sherlock was trying to be elementary. Right. So, And it soon ashes on bones. So they start quoting um, meditations, and point is kind of more in the direction of a kind of Unabomber type character called Aurelius. Yes. I, yeah. I I also like how Watts, uh, Holmes, and Lestrade are like, Lestrade's like, this is my, th-, and Holmes just like, come, yes, keep investigating, yeah, yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, it's funny, I wrote uh, Aurelius and Waiter, even at that point, I wrote Red Herring, and as it turned out, it, yes and no. <laughs> it was like, okay, you know, yes, both, neither Aurelius or the waiter were truly involved, but it really got us back to, um, it really got us back to the case. So as much as we were led to believe that these were dismissed, they were really big elements of the cases. And just what great writing that was. And of course, we got to talk about the stars of the episodes, the chickens. Oh, yeah. I, I saw that going so wrong. <laughs> I love how Watts is just like, I am not 12, I'm not saying it. <laughs> but she eventually did. Why is there a cock outside my room? Mm-hmm. And, and I, yes, you got me to say it. I put in my notes, will Watson ever get to wake up normal in that house? Probably not. I mean, you know, that's like one of the, the like subtle, f- funny things that they do in this show. Now, from investigating the blast, Holmes realizes that the bomb was not placed in the center of the table, but more towards one end. So, of course, he investigates the people that were killed from that area of the blast, and it leads him to a very high-ranking employee who is actually fast-tracking to be CEO. So, of course, they start looking at the CEO. Who is played? Let's talk about this little thing. Bill Irwin. I mean, come on. (laughs) Who is Lawrence Iver, is their uh, future CEO. Mm. I mean, you got Bill Irwin, who is a, anyone who knows, is a, ma- a great actor and a master. One of the guys who's the few people who still do vaudeville style comedy today. And it's funny, you, we don't even get to really see that from him. Oh, no, no. He is. Lately, he's been playing a lot of villains and dark characters. He's done so good at it, as do a lot of comedic actors. Yeah, it would have been nice to actually, you know, see have him get some lines and a little more uh, acting in. But I guess when you play the uh, the major victim, it doesn't get in the opening scene. It doesn't give you much acting time. I love how Estrada was like just trying to save face at first with him, <laughs> and then, but then he just comes clean. And, and here's another thing the show does so good: is you think someone's a criminal. But they're not the killer because they are doing something else, but still scummy. <laughs> right, and you know, it 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 was kind of funny. You know, we find out that uh, you know that the the current CEO uh, was, you know, um, he's finding out people's prices and really kind of making them into willing prostitutes. And then what's even worse, and while how we find out Lestrade almost kind of, you know, really some of the source of some of his overacting and embarrassment is that he's the pimp. You know, he sets up the meets, he gets the rooms, and he's truly embarrassed. You know, and that's supposed to make us, you know, feel a little sorry for him. And okay, well, you know, it wasn't so. You know, we don't. 
you know, well, we, I th- we, we have to forgive him a little bit. I think it really shows Shepard Tree's acting ability, because Lestrade, as we said, is an addict. He's addicted to fame. He's addicted to people thinking he's a good detective. I think this is him hitting rock bottom. Because when you hit rock bottom, you look at yourself and you don't like what you see, so you try to change. I think that's what this episode, and probably the next one too, is that's what it was for Lestrade. They are doing the the bit with the addiction because now he's living, he's going to be living with Holmes. You know, Holmes is in, you know, know, Drug Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous, all those things. I think it's called Narcotics Anonymous. Right. And, um, you know, so I do, I do think this show really has that, and as a big element, it's as if, you know, the the main writer maybe has some of this issue, and I think it's like he really wants to highlight the the plight of addictions. But I think it's going to work as as a funny case. I think they're going to kind of have redeem Lestrade a little bit and kind of get him back on the track but much like most addicts they always kind of fall back every once in a while they're that's why they say you know they're they're never cured and so i almost see and in the future where lestrade kind of gets back into the limelight and it kind of goes bad again maybe he'll go work for uh, mycroft (laughs) that that would be funny i don't see mycroft putting up with that though even Lestrade at his very best would not be a very good match for Mycroft. He can work security at his restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is it, the, the two Mycrofts in uh, Sherlock and Elementary are just so different. Where, um, you know, in, in Sherlock, you really get the brilliance and... Uh, the true nature of the, I think the book Mycroft, um, that he really does not like interacting with people. That's why he's in the Diogenes Club, and how brilliant he really is. Because you really kind of get that sense that, you know, as just a pure thinking man, he has the edge on Holmes. Yet Holmes really has the edge on Mycroft because he can more relate with people. And the law, and you know, uh, kind of things out more in the real world. But the the uh, the elementary Mycroft is really kind of a really smart party boy that's just really pissed off at uh, at uh, the elementary Holmes. Yes, and of course Holmes. Uh, we learned that Holmes might have had a hand in proving Pluto is not a planet. Apparently. <laughs> That was a good element. I did love the uh, the scans and the heat scans from NASA. And, of course, we find out that you know, Sherlock actually changed the Pluto theory <laughs> and gave to the credit to some scientist, right? Yes. Well, we don't know how much. He said he was involved. I don't know if he was directly the one because he's not exactly a – he's not an astrophysicist or anything, though. But he did mention directly that he thought Pluto was, you know, really um, almost a moon of Neptune, or at least a, a traject. You know, I forget what they called it, but um, yeah. But it it was kind of a fun, a fun twist, and I really did like the the use of the technology. Mm. You know, I don't know that you know, even if magnesium did burn at five thousand degrees, I mean, you have to figure how many places in the world you know, magnesium filaments are in your light bulbs, you know, the old incandescents. Uh, you know, really, would you get that kind of signature? Maybe, but if the science is valid, how cool was that? Well, if well, the writers usually try to do it most of the time, but if any of our listeners know the answer, feel free to email us at elementary at bakerstreetpodcast at gmail.com. I keep doing that because the show's called Elementary. <laughs> listeners, bear with me. I am a genius. <laughs> but it's uh, bakerstreetpodcast at gmail.com, bakerstreetpod at Twitter, and bakerstreetpodcast Facebook. Please enlighten us. Tell us. Let us know we're not just talking to ourselves. Somebody rate us on iTunes. Come on! So then we find out, of course, it is a red herring. Aurelius is dead. 
uh, he he blew himself up in a uh, a chemical device, uh, and you know what had had been dead for about a week. What's funny is when I saw that he was dead, I thought they were going to go the route that whoever killed the people like hired him or something. Well, I thought it was even funnier that you know in you know as a sideline to this case that you know the New York City task force had been searching this for this guy forever and you know they he winds up getting uh solving the case and it doesn't even actually truly in the end relate to what's happening with the uh with this particular case so you know Sherlock solves another huge mystery as a byline to this one right now i, I was a little iffy about how when they found really cuz it's like so he was experimenting with new chemicals, and he wasn't wearing a gas mask, so he was a moron? Well, they weren't new chemicals. It was actually chlorine, but... Yeah, Still. It, it, yeah, if you're if you're putting a device... Yeah, why don't you wear a respirator, I, I, I genius? Can, I, can, I can buy a, a dumb guy blowing himself up, I can, or something like that. But this guy was obviously a smart, experienced bomber. I don't think he would have gone out like that. That's if that's a nitpick, fine, but it's just my opinion. Well, you know, that's the thing is, yeah, criminals are not so smart for a reason. They're criminals. If they were, you know, if they were really on the ball, you know, there's no such thing as a professional criminal unless you're talking about Wall Street. But uh, a little oh, jab there. Oh. Yeah, I can see somebody kind of you know, getting that uh, kind of overconfidence. However. It just kind of said, you know what, it you, it was a red herring. Now we don't think it's a red herring. Now we confirm it's a red herring. But still, the fact that Sherlock was able to solve it as you know just by looking through one case of files in a twenty-four hour period, I I, I thought that was kind of ingenious. Now what's interesting is now that pretty soon after that's when um. Lestrade's boss starts to get blackmailed, and what we learn later is that, really, if the person hadn't done the blackmail, they never would have been caught by Holmes, maybe. Right, it, yeah, that's the whole thing that opened it up and said, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's re-look at that table and and say, okay, you know, why, would he, why would you blackmail for this? Okay, all right, well, this guy was going to get the report, was going to put it out, Who's the next one that moves into that slot? But Michelle Forrester, who's sitting in the hospital, you know, having, you know, uh, even though she was in the blast area, definitely it nothing was um, kind of aimed at her. Well, I, I, what I find it, it's it's the old story. Oh, you hear you hear hooves, you think horses, not zebras. It's the same story, <laughs> right? And so now we find out. Okay, we've got uh, we've got our villain now, <laughs> who's you know kind of blown up. But that you know that's a classic mystery story. Is you know one of the people that you know have been part of an attempted murder uh, turns out to be the villain. Mm. It, you know, this episode because of what why the killer did what she did. It kind of reminded me of that episode with the killer secretary. <laughs> oh, right, right. Where she she's killing to get her way to talk. It's just, it's, in my opinion, it's a similar. It's not the same concept, obviously, but it's very similar. But I love. I just. I will always love how it turns out that the C and the CEO's like, well, what if? And the CEO was fully planning to pay her off. <laughs> Unless Strauss just like no. I, I I like I'm guilty of he's like I'm guilty of so many things but I guess you could say like I think that was his rock bottom he's that's when he it, it's a different kind of addiction so it's a different kind of rock bottom it was him not he's not gonna let a murderer go free no matter what <laughs> I hate to say it have you seen the uh, the TV series Workaholics heard of it never watched it what does um... One the the girl that works in the office as the assistant to the manager, kind of reminded me a little of Michelle Forrester. Really, but yeah, you'd have to you'd kind of to get a chuckle out of it. You'd actually have to see the show. It's um, it's really kind of like these three guys that 
kind of act like they never got out of high school or the frat at college and they're just they're always getting in trouble and and uh in, you know, drunk at work or different or they're always sitting on their roof drinking beer and they're you know, like like one time they actually got uh, kind of intimidated and beat up beaten up by a girl at the bus stop <laughs> and, but I uh, anyway back to our TV show. Yeah, well, if you want to do a workaholic podcast, you can talk to Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, I don't see that happen anytime soon. But I would do it. It's a fun show. But yeah, check out the uh, the manager's assistant and compare her with Michelle Forrester, and let us know what you think. I just like how Gregson's like you're not going to be going anywhere for a while. <laughs> Well, I don't know about you, but this concludes the notes of Dr. Watson. And I think I have surmised everything I will for this week's episode. But I'm looking forward to where they're going with Lestrade. I give this episode a good rating. It was interesting. Side stories were good. And I was, and I, I, like I said, where they're going with Lestrade, I am very, very interested. Yeah, I agree. I think... Um... If, if they're able to redeem himself, maybe I'll feel better and not so embarrassed for him. Well, the show very rarely does does anything without a point. That is true. I mean, they're doing good good writing and good plot twists, so I'm looking forward to the next elementary. Indeed. And no more Olympics, so next week's episode will actually be new. Yay! <laughs> All uh, right, I think yes, we have touched upon. Oh, but, oh, oh yeah, of course. Oh wait, wait, we forgot to talk about the chickens. Oh yes, because apparently Holmes's method. I love how Watson's impressed, and she's just like, "We own chickens now, so they own chickens and a turtle and bees and Lestrade." Oh yes, the new pet. What is Mrs. Hudson coming back though? That's the one character they still need to. Oh, now I remember what I wanted to bring up. What's interesting, if they're going the route of Lestrade improving himself, tent, and he's living with Holmes, that kind of, it's like it makes Holmes his sponsor. So what's going to happen when the other guy meets Lestrade? <laughs> well, I think they've made it so that, um, you know, Bell really, uh, what's it, um, what's it, Gregson and uh, Bell, the the captain? Yes. Uh they're really their own entity, and they kind of in, in in this story universe, they kind of put up with um, with Holmes. You really as okay, hey, he's useful and quirky, and we'll kind of put up with it. But they're definitely there's a competence to them, and you kind of have the feeling that they would do just fine without him. However, he solves so many of their cases, they're glad to have him on board. Whereas Lestrade is going to be, you know, more like a student or a pupil or kind of that sidebar. He's just not in the same league with Gregson and Bell. So I think it'll be enough of a different storyline that there won't really be a competition. Yeah, I can't wait to see if Lestrade meets Gregson. Oh, I'm sure he will. You know, if he's, he would have to be. And of course, you know, really, you know, Gregson is the captain of a New York City police department. Number one, he's not going to be in any way intimidated by him. And he's definitely not going to be impressed because, you know, really in, in this series, Gregson has sometimes actually kind of been the character that's almost the most disappointed or, or, or been able to almost be in a, uh, a position to judge uh, uh, Holmes and, and quite harshly, you know, he's, you know, he's, you know, been irresponsible and hurt, you know, one of his men got one of his men hurt and, you know, actually, you know, slugged him in the stomach one time and, you know, just say, you know, hey, you deserved it and I got to get this out of the way. And, you know, Gregson right now, unless, you know, he really, he'll try to, to vibe him a little bit or he may make a comment or two like, hey, I'm the great detective, but I could see Gregson just squashing him quick. Totally. And yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to see where they're going with well, I think that's it for this week. We've talked about big we talked about explosions, big cocks, and hitting rock bottom. <laughs> there you go.
How much? <laughs> I think that uh, that concludes today's uh, today's story notes. Indeed, it has, and of course, and apparently it's going. And I, I sh- just a few more episodes, probably, till we get the big seat. I wonder if will this season season finale measure up to last year's? Who the frick knows? But Jack, do you have anything else you wish to add? No, I'm done over here. All right, then. Well, that's all for this week. Tune in for a lot of new episodes. And don't forget, we got so much to... Actually, Jack, do you have any shameless plugs you got before we head out? Well, as you remember, on every podcast, I use my tweaked audio headphones. I'm using them right now to monitor the show. There, If you go to the Southgate Media Group website, you can click on the banner you go and use the southgate code and you get 30 percent off so just wanted to remind you there and i would like to remind you that just because this is not the only place you can reach me or hear me because pretty soon winter is coming and a song of ice fire dragon and wolves the game of thrones podcast ah! and i'll be doing that with the amazing wildling that is cheryl wilson it's and she's going to be doing her own offshoot episode the three-eyed raven so you better come check that out or i'll be very hurt and also in april <gasps> very exciting we don't have a name yet but it's going to be me and don will be doing a warehouse 13 podcast and you're going to want to check it out because it is the last season of that amazing show and that is my last shameless plug so for now from everyone from southgate media i must depart because the game is afoot if you would like to donate to help pay for this and other southgate media group podcasts simply go to our website southgatemediagroup.com and click on the donate button it can be as little as a dollar or well as much as you want (laughs) help keep this fun going by supporting this and our other shows thanks again for listening everyone you're the best fans in the world